This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. So, hi, welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. My name is Reeves. I'm a poet and multimedia artist, and I am here in discussion today with a poet and multimedia artist, my new friend, Rachel Eliza Griffith. Hi. Hi, good morning, Reeves. How morning. are you? I'm really good, actually. I thought we'd get right into it because we did a reading yesterday, and we got hit with the first cue in our Q&A. It's always the same. It's where do you get your inspiration? And you and I realized for a pretty common question, we don't have a set answer. No, we don't. Right. So we need one. I thought, I thought <laughs> do we we'd need do, one? Well, we're going to, right? <laughs> I thought we would just do a speed round of influences. We can talk about it if you want, but it's just give me your pantheon. You know, it's the whole, you know, William Blake, uh, when the half gods <laughs> go, the gods arrive. So let me throw out topics, or you can throw them out as well and tell me. So first of all, just poets. Who's the pantheon? Who do you not mm. get inspired without? I always need a combination of Neruda, Jay Wright, and Lucille Clifton. Mm. If I have them around me, I feel like I can only fall so far. That's, that's one hell of a dinner party, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a sublime dinner party. Right. What about you, Reeves? I, I always come back to Emily Dickinson. Mm. Try, if I could try to get away, I would not. She would, she would bring me back. Wallace Stevens rocks my socks off, and I'm trying to think of someone living, but I almost don't let anybody living in because it's a pantheon after all. You know what I mean? I it's like putting someone on a coin. You don't know what they're going to do. So let me just stick with those two. Let's, let's do speed round. Let's go to visual artist. Frida Kahlo mm -hmm. would be pretty high up on my list mm -hmm. as far as um, a visual artist goes. She's amazing. And then I'd probably put Jean-Michel Basquiat after that. Hmm. You live in Brooklyn. I do have live in Brooklyn. Have you been to his grave in I Greenpoint Cemetery? I absolutely have been Were to his grave. Were you disappointed by it? I thought it would be this big wall of graffiti. Uh, I did too. Because I've been to Oscar Wilde's grave in Paris. With Covered with kisses? Covered right. with kisses. Right. I left a few this of my own. Paris Cemetery. <laughs> well, I thought Greenpoint Cemetery is interesting. We could go on. I, I think it's so disappointing. Uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany is buried there, but there's no oh, stained glass on his you know, tombstone. Samuel Morse is buried there. There's no Morse code. There's no Morse code. The Wizard of Oz is buried there, and there's no <laughs> Emerald City. And Basquiat, is, it just says Jean-Michel Basquiat. It's like, where's the, yeah. you know, where's the graffiti? Yeah. And someone needs to take care of that. Um, I would say uh, Richard Diebenkorn. Mm, I love Diebenkorn. And Joseph Cornell. <gasps> I, 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 uh, I yeah. hate him. He's, Why? Because he's astonishing. Chicago has the best collection of Joseph Cornells, and I spend so much time in that room, and... I just think, okay, you you bastard. <laughs> I, I get it. Um, Those shadow boxes, though. Yeah, right. They seem like po poems to me, visual poems. They, they, they have I so think, many themes in them. I think that they are perfect. Mm -hmm. When I, I see this as a as a thing to look at and consider, I I can I think that some of those are perfect. I do. What about uh, performers? Nina Simone mm. just blows me away. I never got to see her pe perform. I kind of missed the boat on that. But the footage, I mean, she's someone who just three-dimensionally as a performer, as a voice, as a woman, as an artist, just blows me back every time um, I, I see her visually working her mojo. So she's, she's one of the top performers that I feel like I have a posthumous relationship with. I, lo I love her. She's pretty badass. A posthumous relationship. A YouTube only. A YouTube <laughs> only. A YTO relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would have liked to uh, run around and uh, check out some, some, some uh, listening parties with her. Right. No, yeah. No kidding. So yeah. You what about on? you? You know, you mentioned that. Mine, mine are probably, a lot of them are still alive. I should get on that. I haven't seen them live. Get on it. Iggy Pop is doing <laughs> oh his thing, and I have been quite inspired by that you know, Take No Prisoners style. Ray Davies, the lead singer and composer for The Kinks. Oh, wow. From, from early, from tweendom all the way up to today, when I listen <laughs> to that stuff, I say, this is, this is what I'm talking about, you know? Yeah. What about a wild card influence? Uh, any speed hmm. round, somebody influences you that people might not expect? Michael Jackson. 
Well, I don't know if that's so people wouldn't expect. They wouldn't expect it, but anyone who's seen me dance to Michael Jackson music knows that I'm quite inspired uh, by yeah. him. Are you yeah. good? I love to dance. Mm -hmm. well, are you good? That's the... I think yeah. I'm pretty good. All right. You know? But Michael Jackson, I mean, just someone who blows away all borders. When you hear Michael come on, when you hear those tones and that music, there, there's something that just gets us. I miss Michael. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of moments, a lot of, lot of soundtrack scores to my life yeah. over the course of uh, Michael's uh, musical musical markers. What about you? Uh, well, I'm, when I think wild card, I think there are people that I'm a little bit obsessed with who are American obsessive that you might not think. John Muir. Oh, um, wow. Nathaniel Bowditch was a, a navigator during the you know, post Revolutionary <laughs> War. These are guys who. You know, saw something and said, "I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This is my thing." And so, yeah, crazy American obsessives like that who set out to do something single-mindedly and then stick with it. Yeah. That, that close to crazy, but I don't know which side. You know what I mean? Either either that that much not crazy or that much crazy, but just <laughs> just over the line. So let's talk about obsessives. You and I are multimedia artists. Yes, we are. And we should talk about that. Yes, we should talk about that. We haven't really so much in our private conversations, but we did performances yesterday, and we included mm -hmm. multimedia. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. What, what do you think about it? Um, I think, I mean, uh, I think we, we both fall under multimedia artists, um, and we have, which is so wonderful about mixed media, we have different ways of, of, of using our instruments and our tools. And one of the things um, that I got so much delight and kind of curiosity about is your process um, for some of the um, for some of the um, the pieces that you shared yesterday, for example, the the ponytail poem, the kind of ekphrastic work with text and type and motion, um, just. It was just amazing. I don't know if you want to say more about it. I think anybody watching this will, will run to the computer and try to find it. Well, interesting that you, you say that they're going to run to the computer. <laughs> really, right. right? That's, they're not, you didn't say they're going to run to their library or they're going to ask a friend. And this, I think, is just really compelling because this is the reality of things. When people Absolutely. get into this stage versus page discussion, so much of it seems like shit to me about uh, kids these days or, you know, do we lose... Do we lose something when we adopt the new? I, I don't think there's really much of a distinction. You just very naturally said run to the computer because that's what reality we're living in. If we're doing that, I would like to explore that. Um, the idea of ekphrasis is interesting because, you know, ekphrasis sort of interpreting a, a, a piece of art. I don't know if there's a Greek word for it. I'm sure there's not, but I think that ekphrasis also means elaborating on the technology involved to make something. Yeah. That's what I'm fixated on. So if it's mm. a PowerPoint presentation, are PowerPoint presentations art? I know that we sit in dark rooms and we watch people perform them, but I've only seen them about a topic, about spiders or about sustainable architecture. Right. So why not, since we can do so many of these transitions and effects with the PowerPoint or Keynote, why not make that into art? Can it be done? Uh, right. I have an iPad. I do a, a bit with an iPad you saw yesterday. It's a pretty silly bit, but the thing is, I, I, I accept that the iPad's a tool, maybe even a staggering one in the year 2013, <laughs> anyway, but can it be art? I, I mean, the question is so subjective. I think one of the things yesterday, um, again, that I really liked was that Unlike, um, there are those who will say, you know, all of this technology isolates us and, and puts us away from each other. But yesterday, using the iPad, everyone was gathered and everyone was interested and everyone was having um, an experience to some degree with this engagement with the tool. I think it's the curiosity and the imagination that serves the tool um, rather than, oh, I have this great instrument, what can I do with it? So, I mean, I. I, I I think it's, you know, um, the instrument doesn't have any agency until you breathe through it. And I felt that's what a lot of what you were doing yesterday, where you were breathing through these, these machines and these forms and things, and we got to see this, this room in your, your beautiful head, and um, we could all come in. And, you know, poems on the page, poems, poets up on stage, poets on computers. I mean, that's what some of it is about, I think. So, 
Do you, do you have the idea of bravado or maybe just even just the idea of talent in the sense that maybe one of the reasons that I do what I do is so that people can see I'm using what you have. I, I got the iPhone when you got the iPhone, you know? And so you're using it for what everybody else uses it for. I'm doing some crazy stuff with it up in here, right? And right. so I feel like with poetry, you know, the joke is everybody writes poetry because everybody went to high school, right? <laughs> but how do, you see, how do you tell who's better, who's worse? You know, there's that kind of thing. I, I do think that there, for me, there's a certain bit of swagger possibly, just now thinking about it, in the multimedia. It's like, what's the difference between you and me? Same thing that there's always been a difference between amateurs and professionals or whatever, right. and that's talent. You know, right. it's like I get to take the thing and turn it into something. Is that just overweening or... Or do you, do you relate to that at all, where you say, okay, I'm going to apply my talent to this? Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I think talent, you know, your 10,000 hours, your 15 minutes of fame, as Warhol might say, I mean, talent is going to, to trump any device, um, human, machine, or otherwise. I'm hoping it, it will, because it, what's behind talent um, which I think is really important, there has to be a bridge between talent and hard work. You don't just use your iPad or your phone in a very kind of effortless way. You have to know the programming. You have to learn software. You have to learn how to edit. You have to do a lot of mistakes before you get to that moment where you can stand up in front of us and show us finally what came together out of the process. So it's not, I, I don't see it as, oh, you know, Eves knows how to use uh, uh, an iPad. I'm thinking it must have took him hours mm. to figure this out. I'm very slow with the technology, um, despite being a photographer and, and um, painting and, and making these kind of visual literary um, shorts that I've been working on recently. But it takes a lot of time, and it's, it's different, but it's still part of editing and revising and time-old things that poets um, have employed to tell their stories, um, storytellers orally are on the page, you know. So it's not, it's talent, but it's a tremendous amount of hard work and having that vision to say, well, I have an iPhone and these are some of the other things that I might be able to do with this. I have these apps, I have Instagram. I mean, there's a whole kind of democracy that's flooding everything where I'm reluctant to talk about privilege as far as you know, it's not for me to say who's better or who's not or who's an amateur. I really don't know. I mean, I, I, and I don't, I don't want to know. I don't want to know everything, so. Well, having you talk about it like that does make me think I want to change it a little bit. But I think what, what brought that to mind is what you exactly just now described. It's the difference is craft. And craft, I think with the yes. newfangled stuff, if you want to call it that, people say, well, what's the difference? My, my four-year-old uses this. And, and there is that idea of, well, you're not going to be able to come up with something unless you have the craft. And I think it's much easier to show that than it is, say, words on the page. Yes. Right? Because you know, how do you know that your coworker's daughter isn't a good poet? You know? Right. Yeah, so, but uh, let's, let's talk about that because we were mentioning earlier, we use technology uh, yes. sometimes a lot. Mm -hmm. I sometimes use it exclusively in a set. It's possible for me to do a 45-minute set using a screen. I sometimes have the fantasy that this, the power goes out in the building. I often get to perform in theaters that were made before recording sound, right? They're right. made for the human voice, for opera or theater. And I always think that, well, if that happens, I'm going to walk to downstage center, even if the microphone's off. I'm going to put it down, and I'm going to... I'm gonna do my thing, right? You know, You're gonna I get still old have school. That. I'm gonna go old school on All that. Right. Do you do you have that? Uh, I don't know that. I have that desire. Reverie. <laughs> and, um, I have that desire, and I hope one day it won't be nostalgia for it. Um, but I have some old school if you're interested. I want to hear a little bit of one of her performance. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm that I'm after with all my mixed media voices is this conversation with beauty. So this is a little bit from a poem of mine called "According to Beauty." Beauty was a memory, the voice said. The voice belonged to everyone, which made it into thunder. It was memory waiting in a corner like a riff of selves in the dark. I am an outlaw woman, shadow boxing, my life too quick to bruise. What is the name for those who collect the beautiful? That's nice.
Thank you. What is the name for those who are going to be? Get old school, me. Tell yeah. me. I, I'm, I'm a, you know, <laughs> reprobate classics major trying to literally put something together. I don't know, pulchrid, pulchrid grabber. I don't know. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have to think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wow, well, for for a word that means beauty, pulcher in Latin sure is an ugly word. Now that I think about it. Very ugly, yeah. but for me, um, beautiful things involve asymmetrical words and languages. Really? Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite word or in English? Then? Oh my goodness, I have so many words for so many from so many languages. Well, I mean, I'd like to parse them for asymmetry from what you're just now saying. I don't know. The word gorgeous, mm. I think it might mean something different in different languages. Any, any other ones? Fav I mean, I'm, I'm fixated on favorite words, especially from poets. I like guacamole. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you know where it comes from? It comes from an avocado. <laughs> it does come from an avocado. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Avocado is a, is a Nahuatl word. You know, mm -hmm. Aztecs said the word. And mm -hmm. in Aztec, it means, from what I've heard, it means testicle, which I think is fantastic. That's, you know, somewhere in 1340, there were a bunch of yeah, it's texting around going, come on, I mean, come on, <laughs> come on, guys. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. I love how women have appropriated the shape and texture and meaning of avocados into visual art. Well, you're thinking of Frida Kahlo? Or, I'm thinking or just... of Frida, I'm thinking of students of mine who mm -hmm. do self-portraits and they often, you know, avocado is actually a fruit. I'm a native of California. I was uh, yo nací in Los Angeles. I was born in Los Angeles, California, and I don't know if you do this. So where, where, where are you from? Where were you born and raised? I was born in Washington, D.C., just no. a few miles away. Well, let me ask you, we both live in New York City now, but I don't yes. know if you do this particular thing. Uh, I do this with almonds, <laughs> and I do it with pistachio nuts and avocados. When I'm at a bodega or I'm at a store and I see the product, I take it and I look at the label. And if it says Producto de Chile on my avocado, I'm like, I'm not going to buy that. I only buy California avocados. <laughs> Same thing with almonds and pistachios. We are trained as California children to do this. Mm. I'm just, you, don't, you don't know where your almonds come from? Sounds like a mixed media project to me. All right. Well, maybe. <laughs> just so you know, your baby carrots are coming from my home state. <laughs> I just want to go back, though. I, w I was wondering if you just might um, just talk about, I I'm really interested, you brought up um, earlier obsolescence, and last night you were talking about your poems not being written down anywhere and how, how they'll kind of live and walk around in the world without you to breathe into them. Do you think about that a lot? How, how is that? reflect a relationship with the immediacy of the art that you're making, which seems to me it reaches so many um, through, a, through a number of medium. Well, I really like obsolescence. I'm kind of aiming for it because you can't aim for it. You don't know what's going to look dated. Someone told me once that when, if you watch movies from the 50s, science fiction movies, whenever they travel into the future, Everybody's dressed futuristically, but the men are all still wearing hats. And, you know, <laughs> like they're futuristic hats, but that's how you know it's the 50s. And that all of the electronics are controlled by dials. You know, like, the, they couldn't see that we're going to not use dials for right. these things. Uh, futuristic looking ones, but I like that. I like aiming for that and saying, thinking, this, it, it takes the, it takes the pressure of, making something that lives on forever. It's going to live on regardless, you right, know, right. of your efforts to conceal it or right. deny it or interpret it yourself. Right. So I like throwing stuff out there that it may become, it literally may become trite or quaint in a month with the, with the latest upgrade. Right. It's like watching some movie uh, with someone pulls out a huge cell phone. You go, well, hello, 1999, right? <laughs> you know? And yes. I like that. I like the idea that my stuff will look of a particular place in time. Mm -hmm. um, I used to make pop-up books for a living. I was a paper engineer. I consider this, you know, the, like old school multimedia. And I think the pop-up books I made would have looked charming to someone 50 years ago. Mm. And I think that they will look charming to someone 50 years from now. I think the child will open these pop-up books and, and really get a charge out of them. Right? Even it's the about adult. I love pop-ups. Right. They're so, so great. That's what I try to do with books. I tried to jump fully into that, this idea of legacy and what you leave behind. But as soon as I started doing multimedia, I went the opposite direction. I want you to look at something and be able to pick, not from my clothes or you know <laughs> hairstyle or just how I've aged. I want you to be able to pick from what machine I'm using or what I'm talking about 
within a couple years. Mm. You know, without being topical, without mentioning the Obama second inaugural or something like that, right, but literally right. just saying, oh, that guy's got a second generation iPad. And, and to, to place, I think that's really compelling. Yeah. Um, because I think that the art will come through. I think the message will come through Mm -hmm. And people will see what I'm trying to do. And mm -hmm. Like he was trying to tell a boy meets girl story. Exactly. Yeah. I, th I think that's right. I was I was reading recently or rereading some some interviews um, with Marcel Duchamp, and he was talking about things he made in time and and how paintings are made these days, and kind of just you know how much time and effort things just seem so ready made um, in this day and age, and everyone is kind of after that quick quick fix of art, that quick ready-made thing. And um, I think about that a lot with some of the mixed media things um, that, I, that I work on, you know, video shorts that are associative of, um, of imagery from poems, um, either my own poems or, or other contemporary po poets or even dead poets, and um, thinking about some of the art and things that I'll see in galleries and museums or, or installations or um, performance artist who it's it's more about the theater of that experience and that moment and and not maybe taking it so seriously and and trying to you know pour cement into sand it seems like can we talk for a bit about taking oneself seriously a little Let's bit because talk about it i'd like to i just from considering your presentations yesterday and, and, and getting to know you a little more because we have mutual friends. We have a, a bunch of mutual friends. We do. Dozens and dozens. We haven't we hadn't met before. I feel like there's a pretty big spectrum of how poets take themselves, how seriously poets take themselves. And I feel like not only that, it becomes a badge of how you are interpreted by your audience. I feel Billy Collins, we we like him because he doesn't take himself seriously, whereas we 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 also like Sylvia Plath because she really, really does, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think as an audience, it, it's helpful to know about that. I'd actually like to know how seriously you think you, you take yourself. Mm, I don't, I mean, I think when I'm, when I'm writing, I'm pretty, I'm pretty serious and I'm pretty terrified. Um, so when I'm on the page, I don't have, I can't be reckless in that way. But you know, reading or um, reading or, or talking, you know, there's just a fleeting transience. And for me, there's always a proportion or a scale where I'm quite small. And I find that highly comforting. Um, I, you know, I think delusions of grandeur get in the way of getting work done. And so for me, getting work done is, is what I'm after. And, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm reading something on the page, and I haven't done my work, um, that's the conversation I, I'm into. Most of the time, um, those, those who know me, I'm, I'm always cracking jokes and kind of quiet and observant. Um, but not, I don't say not, re I don't think very seriously though. I think serious, um, you know, the word gets a bad rap because the way even that we inflect it and use it depending on what we're talking about, can kind of tilt it either way. Um, you know, I love things seriously. I like things seriously. I dislike things seriously. Right. You know, um, there, are, there are poets who are quite serious, and then there are poets who are not serious, but their work is, or um, what they care about, what they're writing about is, um, in a way, because it's personal. So I'm, I'm always after, the guts and bowels of things. Um, that's serious. You need your internal organs to walk around. All right. <laughs> Thanks. That's, that, that's, that's, it just nice. got weird with a capital yeah. We. <laughs> yes. In fact, nice work, by the way. Uh, uh, <laughs> dropping. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I need to uh, do a performance, actually, before we wrap. You do. And I'm gonna, I'll do that. I'll take take it from that poem. Please uh, that do. You dropped a line from my poem, Compliment. Yes. Um, I, I, the poem is a love poem, and it's about a girl. And I say that she's weird with a capital we, and then I continue, uh, but I'm not insisting you're some kind of goddess. I know you're suspicious of unspecific love poems. You're more like a sunflower growing in the courtyard of an old folks' home. You mean things to people on a daily basis, and this petty poem won't explain just how my favorite your face is, but I wish I'd been your bathroom mirror the day they took off your braces. 
You are so pretty. And then the, the poem continues. Yeah. It's a fantastic poem. Sometimes I swear when I say you are so pretty too, but I didn't. Sometimes the F word goes in. <laughs> trying to explain the frustration that I have with, you know, coming up with a word pretty when it seems trite, but it works in the thing. I think it works beautifully. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about beauty. We have a, a, you know, let's do a speed round on beauty. Beauty. Complicated. Really? Love it, hate it. I interrogate it. Do I you? ask questions. Uh, that's why I mentioned it, because it seems like you do from your work, absolutely. Yeah. I do, particularly as a photographer, I'm, I'm quite, quite adamant and vigilant about a constant questioning and revising and expanding of what it means um, to invoke the word as, as language and also the practice of it. And the um, way that it works in, in language and visuals is something um, I think that will be kind of a lifelong um, trial, I think. What about you? Obsessed, absolutely, endless <laughs> quest, uh, feverish. I try to interrogate it, but I feel like Quasimodo or Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> I'm still going to stick to the, you know, gruesome poet. I, I, a Rilke line that you like as well. What is it? It's, uh, beauty is the beginning of a terror from which we, we, we are barely endure. able to endure. Barely able to endure. Well, let's, let's we'll go out on that. Actually, let's we'll go let out Rilke with endurance. Take us out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Why don't you take us out? It's been so nice having this conversation with you, Rachel Eliza. It has been a gift, Reeves. I had such a great time. Thank you so much for our conversation today. Thank you for joining us today for Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. Thanks for being here. Thank you.